I'm Simon McQueen Mason and I uh, study plant cell walls at York and so I've recently started using this slide at the start of talks because mostly I'm going to talk about deconstructing <coughs> plant biomass, woody plant biomass to try and get useful things out but it's always nice just to remind ourselves about what secondary plant cell walls, the woody plant cell walls do for plants. They're really at the base of how vascular plants have become so dominant in the terrestrial biosphere. So plants like this one here can reach about 100 metres in height and about 60,000 tonnes in, in mass. So really massive organisms. And that's all held up by the strength of the secondary cell walls, which also provide the material that allows water to be transported 100 metres up those plants as well, sucked up purely by um, transpiration. So these are really quite incredible materials. Um, they do a lot for plants. They're strong. They're also very durable. And that's part of why um, they're available in a lot of abundance in, in the biosphere and as residues from things that we do. And that's kind of why we're interested in them from the perspective of sort of industrial biotechnology. I should press the right thing. So I'm going to be talking about developing plant biomass, and by that I mean this kind of woody plant biomass, as a sustainable industrial feedstock. And um, I've called this also the digestibility challenge, because it's how do we get useful sugars ultimately out of those materials. So the context is one that we heard about quite a bit in, on the first day, and this is to do with the challenges that we're facing as a, as a species, really. Um, we know that there's an increased demand for food, fuel and water globally and we also know that burning fossil fuels is uh, really driving climate change I think we're all pretty certain of that now and so we know that we need to decarbonize and um, the very specific area that I'm interested in is how do we replace petroleum that we depend on for many things so it provides us with transportation fuels industrial chemicals and materials and We've become very dependent on this because it's available in bulk. It allows us some very versatile chemistry to produce these things. And it's really cheap. I mean, historically, you just drill a hole into the ground and it comes out. You transport it away and you do things. So um, we also have very mature industrial processes for producing all of these things at very low cost. Um, the downsides in red are that it's a non-renewable resource. It's finite and diminishing. We know that as it diminishes, we have to go to harder sources to access with consequences. Critically, um, burning fossil fuels gives a net addition of CO2 to the atmosphere, which we know is driving global warming. And as a material, it's hazardous and polluting potentially. So generally, this is unsustainable in the future. So plant biomass we're interested in, and here I'm talking about biomass in its general sense, I suppose. So it has the potential to provide the same um, materials that we get from petroleum because you've got the same complex carbon chemistry at the heart of this as you have at the heart of this. It's also abundant. Um, it's renewable, so that's a, a benefit. So um, because it's uh, renewable, it's potentially CO2 neutral as well. So the carbon that you release when you burn um, a biological material is balanced by the fixation of that carbon into the next crop, if you like. Um, potentially very cheap as well. Not as cheap as petroleum in truth, I don't think. Um, the, down <coughs> the downsides that we face at the moment is developing the conversion technologies to get these materials into the sorts of things that we want to use. The supply chains around doing this on the sorts of scales that we're interested in um, are underdeveloped. And the sustainability is a little bit tricky because... Um, we get impingement, particularly on the area of food security that comes along with this source of biomass. Um, as if we're going to use it at the sorts of scales that we use petroleum, then we need an awful lot of this material. So this slide um, shows how we currently make biofuels. And the so-called first-generation biofuels are produced from plant biomass, but from the same bits of biomass that we use for food as well. So we're looking at sugars, starch, um, going through fermentation to make alcohols, or oils through transesterification to make biodiesel. We know that if we expand um, greatly the, the production of fuels from these materials, that's going to have a negative impact on food security. So we need to be looking at how we can generate that from the non-food parts 
of plant biomass that we currently don't have much use for. And this is the lignocellulosa called the woody plant biomass, the, se the secondary cell wall material from these um, plants. And there are two general routes that you can produce biofuels um, from these. One is a thermochemical route, which I'm not going to talk about. Um, but the area that I'm involved in is, is this biochemical route, where, again, we're trying to produce sugars from these materials that then can go into fermentation, either to produce alcohols or for bulk chemicals as well. So, the sorts of things we're talking about. So, I've got a picture of a cereal here. Um, the key point to this is that there's as much sugar tied up in the polysaccharides of the um, secondary cell walls that make up the stems of these plants as there is in the starch of the grain, which we currently use to make biofuels. So, that's what we want to access. And the sorts of Sources of biomass that we're talking about are crop residues like straws and husks, waste, including municipal solid waste, an area that we've got interested in recently. Um, but also there's quite a lot of work that goes around dedicated biomass crops, although there are um, potential uh, uh, complications around that to do with indirect land use change or even direct land use change. So what are we talking about in terms of what lignocellulosic plant biomass is, as I keep saying, it's secondary plant cell walls. And so plant cell walls are, are, are the fibre composite materials that give strength to plant tissues. They uh, are flexible composites in primary cell walls where they are used to counterbalance turga pressure and involved in regulating growth and expansion in plants. In secondary cell walls, these are things that lay down after growth, they're much um, more rigid and much harder and much more durable materials. But in both cases, they're fibre composite materials based around cellulosic microfibrils. These are crystalline arrays of beta-1,4 glucans, have a higher tensile strength than steel and give the inherent sort of strength to plant cell walls. These are embedded in a matrix of um, so-called hemicelluloses. These are um, complex polysaccharides with side chains that can't form these crystalline structures um, and serve in primary cell walls to plasticize the cellulosic um, network so that it has some flexibility. In secondary cell walls, they are much less involved in that, so there's much less water in a plant's secondary cell wall. And that comes about partly from the nature of the hemicelluloses, but also because these composites then get infiltrated by and encrusted in um, a polyphenolic polymer called lignin. And this is extremely durable, hydrophobic, and uh, makes the material very hard to digest. And so you end up with a really a macromolecular, uh, very difficult to digest composite, which is made up of about 70% polysaccharides, which is why it's attractive. And a lot of that polysaccharide is glucose or is made up of glucose. So it's a very attractive substrate if you can get it out economically. And that's really the, the challenge. And this is referred to as the biomass digestibility challenge. So those sugars are locked up in there, but we need to be able to get them out in a cost-effective manner. And so work in my group really looks at two approaches to improve digestibility. One of these is looking at what is it about that cell wall material that makes it hard to digest and what opportunities do we find in natural variation or induced variation or through transgenesis, etc., that might change that in a way that makes it more digestible. We have to always be thinking about whether that's going to compromise field performance. You don't want a crop that's really digestible but falls over, for example. We also work in the area of looking for uh, new enzymes and new ways of converting lignocellulosic biomass. And I'll give some examples of both of these areas in, in my talk. So the first bit I'll talk about is some of the work that we've been doing in terms of trying to understand digestibility in plant cell walls and, and how that might be manipulated. And a lot of that work started in a Framework 7 uh, program that came to an end last year, which had this name, Improving Plant Cell Walls for Use as Renewable Industrial Feedstock, and this acronym. And really what we did in this network was we brought together most of the leading plant cell wall research groups in Europe and asked them to focus very much on secondary cell walls. A lot of the groups had focused on primary cell walls. 
we had a lot of expertise, we wanted to bring them in and focus it onto this whole issue, this problem about biomass digestibility, about understanding it, and about how we might be able to manipulate it. So one of the things that we did at York, so the, the program involved um, scrutinizing thousands of different lines of plants, different species, transgenics, uh, mutants, um, and comparing them by their, their, the digestibility of their cell walls. And to do that, we needed a, a robust and reliable high throughput uh, process that we can measure digestibility with. So we have two platforms, one which simply grinds and weighs out plant biomass into 96 well plates with reasonable accuracy and giving you a, a final weight for each well in a 96 well plate. This is targeting four milligrams in each well here. And then that works in combination with this liquid handling uh, platform where four of these 96 well plates can then be processed per day um, through uh, a, 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 a pretreatment, uh, sort of you heat up the material in the presence of mild acid or alkaline or just water. And then after that, cool them down, incubate them with uh, commercial cellulase preparations, which we mostly get from Novozymes. So that goes at 50 degrees for about eight hours. And at the end of that, we simply um, take aliquots and measure the amount of reducing <coughs> sugars that have been released by the cellulases and use that as a measure of digestibility. And so it enabled us to do a number of things. Um, I'm just showing this one example. So this is work we did with um, some of there's, there's several very good groups in, 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 in Europe that work on lignin biosynthesis. This is the pathway for the biosynthesis of monolignols. I'm not going to go into it. Simply to say that we um, had Arabidopsis mutants at a number of the key enzyme steps in the pathway. And we could then measure digestibility across this population of Arabidopsis mutants and identify ones where you get a significant impact on digestibility. And we've, we've done this through um, lots of different uh, areas of, of cell walls. And essentially using that sort of a reverse genetics approach, so saying we think we know how lignin's made or cellulose is made and we know the various genes that are involved in that, what happens when you knock them out or modify their activity. Then what you start to see is the major impact on digestibility really does come from lignin, but cellulose crystallinity is very important and some areas of the composition of the hemicelluloses is, is important too. So the hemicellulose is actually formed cross covalent cross-links with the lignin. And if you break some of those, you get quite a, quite a profound impact on digestibility. So as well as doing the reverse genetics, we also um, went for more hypothesis, I can't say that word, hypothesis-free approaches to look at, if we looked at natural variation or induced variation, what do we see, or what, you know, if, we, if, we, if we find things from mutant populations or just through looking through diversity collections, look for the things that show high digestibility or indeed low digestibility, and then try and identify either the loci that have been altered or, or specifically the genes. And so um, this is an example of some of that work. This is work from uh, Poppy Marriott, who's in the, in the audience. She's doing a PhD looking at um, digestibility, or we've called it saccharification here, um, in uh, Brachypodium distachyon, a, a model grass. And here we've um, got populations of the grass, you can see them growing here, which have been mutagenized um, to produce point mutant populations. And from screening, I think this is about 3,000 plants, Poppy found 12 heritable um, lesions that uh, uh, increase the digestibility of the, the plant cell wall material. And she's been characterizing those in terms of their cell wall composition. And what you can see is that a number of these are very clear lignin mutants. So this is lignin content. Lots of arrows, dark colors mean a big decrease because these are down arrows in lignin here. Um, so some of these things are very obviously lignin mutants. Other things are a bit more subtle. So this SAC2 mutant, we really don't know what's going on there. It has a big impact on digestibility, but we, you know, we haven't figured out exactly what's going on there. Other plants, so this one, for example, there's a change in cellulose crystallinity, but there's also an alteration in the ferulic acid content, which is very important for cross-linking to lignin. 
So we're now mapping some of these lesions to identify exactly what's going on, and this will make a nice comparison with the reverse genetics approach that we've been taking. So we're, we're part of the BBSLC Sustainable Bioenergy Centre. This is a, um, a centre that was funded about five years ago now. It's been going for about five years. And this is a very significant investment by BBSLC in this area. And it, it attempted to sort of cover the supply chain, if you like, from the biomass crops themselves. So these are dedicated lignocellulosic biomass crops right through to the fermentation. And this was done with a series of programs. So there's six programs here. And um, I'll tell you in a while about the marine wood borer enzyme program, which uh, we coordinate here at York. But I'm also involved in the cell wall lignin program, coordinated by Claire Halpin in Dundee, and with Robbie Wall from uh, the James Hutton Institute. So, and in that program, this sort of follows on this theme of looking, in this case, at um, variation across elite cultivars of barley. So we're, we're doing association genetics to look for things that have an impact um, on digestibility, to look for QTL in digestibility. So that they've assembled a large collection of uh, barley cultivars, elite barley cultivars from around the world. They've got very detailed SNP maps of these. And they've been carrying out a range of different phenotypic profiling. And we at York, working with them, have been doing measurements of stem digestibility to identify QTL involved in that. So this is data from 640 genotypes of barley. Um, I think, I'm trying to remember, we, we've measured, I think it's like three or 4,000 samples. It took us several months to do that. You can see here the spread of digestibility data across that population that we got from that. This is the raw data. This is after statistical manipulation to take out field variation, variation on the robots, etc. So this is principally genetic variation that you can see in here. And we've done this over two years, and we know that there is a, a, a number of varieties that are always at this extremely digestible range. So just by doing this, we can identify varieties where that straw is much more digestible. And if somebody wants to grow it for those reasons, um, we know that they also have good field performance because they're elite varieties. But we've also used that data to look for um, QTL. And here you can see, uh, from this is from that one year's analysis, there are nine very significant QTL across the barley genome here for digestibility. And some of these we now know are, are most clearly um, involved in lignin. There are lignin pathway genes under some of these, and we can look at the um, lignin in the contrasting lines associated with these loci. But there are also loci that, um, where, where lignin appears not to be involved. So then moving on to um, the enzyme discovery work. So here we, we're trying to understand or we're trying to look for new enzymes and processes that are involved in lignocellulose mobilization. And we've been working um, with some marine biologists at the University of Portsmouth, principally Simon Cragg. And this is a, a, a so this is a, a so Neil Bruce and I um, coordinate the, the program at York. And this is the animal that we work on. This is a marine wood borer. It's an isopod crustacean called Limnoria quadripunctata. And it seems funny to go to the marine environment to look for things that degrade lignocellulose. Lignocellulose is a peculiarity of land plants. You don't find it in marine plants. But there's a lot of wood that gets into the marine environment through mangroves, through estuaries. And there's a, there's a wide range of animals and microbes in the marine environment that have evolved to live on that material. So this is a diagram of the digestive system of Limnoria. And it's dominated by this long linear hindgut that you can see here. Here you can see it in the EM section. And two features, it's packed with finely chopped wood particles. And it's got a cuticle lining. So there's a lining that prevents the wood from contacting the living cells of the hindgut. And those cells aren't secretory or absorptive. They're purely there to contain this material. So it's chopped up, it's packed tightly in there. And then you've got these accessory organs called the hepatopancreas and you can see some limbs of it there. This plums into that hindgut, so there's, there's a movement of liquid between the two chambers. These are contractile, so you can squish water in and out of this system, and there's a filter that prevents any particles from getting into the hepatopancreas. 
And the hepatic pancreas has the secretory cells that work in this system to produce the enzymes. And we also think that the breakdown products are probably absorbed here as well. The key thing about this is this, this digestive system is, is effectively sterile. There are no microbes in this digestive system. As far as we know, that's the only animal that's been described that has a microbe-free digestive system. It's a very unusual situation. And it's unusual in something that eats wood because most other animals or all the other animals that we know that eat wood do that through um, working with symbiotic or, or, or mutualistic microbes that live in their digestive system and produce many of the enzymes that are involved in breaking down the wood. But in this system, you've got this peculiarity. There's no microbes in there. There's something preventing microbial life because they will ingest microbes with the wood and there's tons of wood in here packed very tightly, so it's an ideal environment. Um, but nothing grows in there. And it means both that the gribble must um, digest wood with its own enzymes, but also must have mechanisms to deal with this problem of breaking open the structure of the lignocellulose for the enzymes to get in there and get the sugars out. And then there's something going on in here which is preventing microbes from living in there as well. So one of the first things we did was uh, do, do some um, transcriptomic sequencing. So we used 454 sequencing of the digestive transcriptome from the hepatopancreas. This is a, a breakdown of what we saw in terms of EST annotations. So about a quarter of the transcriptome um, encodes things that we can recognize as glycosyl hydrolases, things that will digest polysaccharides. That's really nice because we think this is a digestive transcriptome and it's got the right sorts of enzymes. And the other thing that I'll come back to in a little while are these hemocyanins, which are also very um, abundant in this digestive system. And when you look at the... So this is the glycosyl hydrolase. If you take this quarter and look what's in there, there's about 12, or there are 12 glycosyl hydrolase families that we can recognise by their sequences in there. But they're dominated by these two... So GH9s are well-known um, endogleucanase cellulases produced by many animals. But when we did this work, these GH7s were really surprising because they'd never been described in animals before, but they are the major cellulase used by many filamentous fungi that degrade lignocellulose. So this is a phylogenetic tree of those protein classes. Here's the limnoria um, GH9s and they fit in with the known groups of arthropod GH9 cellulases. Here's the GH7s. At the time that we did this work, the only ones that were known were from the filamentous fungi, as I've mentioned, and also from protists. These are endo, or not endo, but they're symbiotic protists that live in the termite digestive system and produce these cellulases to help the termites digest wood. Termites themselves don't produce GH7s. These GH7s are a clear outlier from these groups and very obviously um, produced by the animals themselves, which we've confirmed by in, um, uh, in situ hybridization RNA. Uh, in situ hybridization. And we've gone on to characterize um, these GH7 cellulases from the, the gribble. Um, so we've produced recombinant versions of them. We got some nice crystal structures and we did some detailed structural analysis. Um, they differ from the fungal cellulases in a number of ways. They don't have a cellulose binding domain associated with them. And they operate, if you like, as, as fairly standard cell processive cellobiohydrolases. They chew their way down, releasing two glucose units at a time from the cellulose beta-1,4 glucan strands. The other notable feature was they've got very high stability to salt. So this is activity on two different cellulose substrates in salt concentrations going up to four molar. And you can see there's no significant decrease uh, as you go up into the higher salt concentrations. But what we've been focusing on in, in the last couple of years particularly is, is what, how, how, does this pro, how does this digestive system work? So here's some ship timbers. These are being eaten by gribble. That's what's eating away most of what you can see here. They get through a lot of wood, so they eat roughly their own body weight every week. And what we've found is that they digest about 20% of that material. So they process a lot of wood, but they take out about 20%. And so this is a fecal pellet being produced by the gribble over there. 
One thing that we've observed is that the hindgut is an oxygen sink. So most digestive systems tend to be oxygen sinks because there's a lot of microbial life in there that burns up the oxygen. In this case, we know there's no microbes in that hindgut, so it wasn't obvious why, why it should be, um, uh, have such low oxygen tension. So this is a probe that's inserted into the gut and then withdrawn out of the gut. And you can see the oxygen levels are really low and then they increase as you go away from there. And one hypothesis we had was that that may be those low oxygen levels are there because the oxygen is being consumed to produce reactive oxygen species that might be involved in digesting or breaking up the lignin. And that was confirmed by um, some injections with a fluorescent dye that gives this bright red colour when it encounters uh, peroxides, hydrogen peroxide particularly. And here's one, we also co-injected bromophenol blue so we can see where the dye went to. And when it goes in the hindgut, you get this growing, gl growing, glowing um, gribble, indicating that there's a very uh, high amount of, of free radicals in, in that digestive system. And what we see is that's only associated with the hindgut. So here's a dissected animal where it's been injected with the dye as well. Here's some limbs of the hepatopancreas. Here's the hindgut. You can see it was just a stub. The hindgut's been lost during this preparation, but there's just a stub of it there. You can see the bright fluorescence from the hindgut, but nothing from the hepatopancreas limbs. So if you're producing hydrogen peroxide, um, the one hypothesis, again, that follows on from this is that these animals may be using Fenton chemistry to attack the lignin and probably the polysaccharides as well. And to do that, to produce the um, very reactive hydroxyl radicals involved in Fenton chemistry, you also need transition metals. So this is um, an animal that's been incubated with a dye that is fluorescence in the absence of transition metals, but it loses its fluorescence if it encounters free transition metals. And what we see here is that there's um, good fluorescence in the hepatopancreas, indicating very low transition metals, but in the hindgut, we find no fluorescence indicating that there are transition metals in the hindgut. And we think one of the reasons why you don't get the transition metals in the hepatopancreas is because one of the other transcripts that was really abundant was ferritin. And this is a section through a hepatopancreas cell here. You can see the absorptive and secretory um, surface here. And what you can see here is crystals of ferritin. So we've confirmed that these contain iron. Uh, by EDX. Here, what we've done is we've looked at the, um, we've used electron paramagnetic resonance to look at fecal pellets. And what you can see is if you do that on the ground wood that they're growing on, you get this sort of trace. On the fecal pellets, you get this big signal which indicates free radicals. And the reason you can get free radicals trapped in wood is because they get trapped in the phenol. The complex ring structure can stabilize the electrons. And we can reproduce that effect that we see on the fecal pellets if we treat the wood using Fenton chemistry in the test tube. So the lignin becomes radicalised during digestion. These data show that the lignin has also been chopped up and is more condensed and it's much easier to extract out of fecal pellets than it is out of the wood. And we hypothesise that the source of the, um, of the hydrogen peroxide in the system ought to be coming from something like a peroxidase, but there was nothing like that in the transcriptome. But we did have these hemocyanins, which are oxygen transporters, but have also been shown to be involved in antimicrobial responses and cuticle tanning in arthropods. And so we've shown for the first time that you find hemocyanins in the gut and in the luminal fluids, there should be an L there, of the guts. So hemocyanins are actually getting in there on the wood, and we've shown that they can function as phenol oxidases and that they produce hydrogen peroxide. And what I didn't fully show you at the beginning was what these different fractions here are. So this is the wood, starting wood, here's the fecal pellets. What you lose during digestion is just the crystalline polysaccharides. And that was really surprising because most organisms will go for the non-crystalline polysaccharides first. They're the easiest bit to digest. Um, as I said, cellulose microfibrils, because of their crystallinity, are really hard to digest. And when we look at the compositional changes, what we see is it's just glucose that we're losing in this digestive system. And 
what in fact is happening is the animal is very selectively just going for the, for the cellulose to get the glucose. It hasn't got the enzymes to take the xylose, which is the dominant sugar from the hemicelluloses. And when you look at, as I said, the transcriptome, we've done this by proteomics as well, about 90% of that transcriptome encodes cellulases and they don't seem to have enzymes to degrade the hemicelluloses. So they're very specifically blowing open the wood with free radical treatment and then using cellulases just to go for the glucose. So this is our model for how this works. It's a two-chamber reactor, if you like. You've got a cuticle-lined hindgut protecting the tissues from the rather aggressive chemistry that's going on in here, free radical chemistry, catalyzed by hemocyanins, breaking open the structure of the, the lignin and also helping to break open the structure of the cellulose. And then you've got cellulases coming in and depolymerizing the cellulose. And then in the other organ, you've got these more sensitive living processes that are protected from that free radical chemistry, producing enzymes and absorbing the sugars. And the reason that there's no microbes in the system, we're fairly confident, is because of that aggressive chemical environment. So um, I'd like to acknowledge um, the funders, so Framework 7 and the BBSLC for all the funding we've had towards the work I've been telling you, and this range of uh, researchers in, in York, uh, as well as in Dundee, in, in Belgium, Denmark, and uh, Portsmouth, and the USA that have helped us <coughs> with various aspects of the work. So thank you very much. Thank you.